Welcome to tonight's Finance Committee meeting. This meeting is now called to order for January 19th, 2016. Item number one, please. Consider approval of Finance Committee minutes of 1-5-2016. After review of the minutes, are there any corrections or additions? Move for approval. Second. second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Deputy Mayor James Gully. Yes. Danny Boydston. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Leanne Langston. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. Item one passed. Item number two. Consider approval of claims for all city departments from 12-30-2015 to 1-12-2016 or take other necessary action. Do we have a report from the Purchasing Committee? Yes, sir. The Purchasing Committee met earlier today and we reviewed the, the claims list with the city treasurer and uh, I move for approval. Second. I have a motion and a second for the approval. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Deputy Mayor James Gully. Yes. Janie Boydston. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Leanne Langston. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. Item two passed. Item number three, please. Receive a one-year review and update from Sports Facility Management for the management and operations of Lab Hatbox Sports Complex or take other necessary action. Recognizing Mr. Mark Wilkerson. Doesn't sound like you're on, Mark. Hello, is this better? Yeah. <clears throat> We've reached our one year anniversary in our contract arrangement for operation of the hat box with Sports Facility Management. Um, at our last uh, quarterly review, the city manager asked that SFM come to the city council after the first of the year to make a presentation uh, for how uh, what's happened over the past year and uh, and to talk a little bit about the about the future. So, uh, Jason Clement is the uh, one of the principals at uh, Sports Facility Advisories, and he's come from Florida today to just do that. So that's a reason we've got cold, windy weather, huh? <laughs> Brought it with us. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should do this in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> idea. Uh, from Iowa originally, so this is balmy. <laughs> Well, it's, it's a real privilege to be here. Um, we've had a good year, and uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm grateful and, and blessed to be able to represent um, Neil Hayes, Steve Gorris, and the rest of the SFM team, both uh, on the ground here in Muskogee, also in our corporate office, uh, because a number of people have put uh, a lot of hard work into uh, the results that uh, we're about to present. Um, so uh, our agenda, our goal uh, for, for this evening is to, as efficiently and effectively as possible, uh, walk you through the goals and objectives for 2015, how we performed against those, and then um, give you a little sneak peek for uh, 2016, including the proposed budget um, for, for the following year. So our 2015 goals and objectives, number one was to increase the economic impact and the overall volume of traffic to Love Hatbox. Number two is to take the first step toward building a financially sustainable operation. Number three is improve the overall quality of the park. And lastly, improve the overall guest experience. So we're going to take a look at how we did against uh, each of these four goals. Um, goals one and two, um, drive economic impact and financial sustainability. So 13 months ago, um, we came here in front of this council and uh, presented to you um, the existing trend that the city managed asset was on. So um, this was the trend that uh, Love Hat Box was on um, prior to our management. And what we did is we interpolated that out over five years so you could see what the trend looked like. And uh, over those five years, if you just go to the net operating income, the blue line, you can see that it interpolated out to a $1.1 million subsidy. Um, the one addition for those tracking against what you looked at 13 months ago is the other operating expense. These are expenses that hit um, Love Hatbox's budget this year that hadn't previously. Uh, the previous city manager reorganized the, the Parks and Rec um, department and those expenses that were on the Parks and Rec uh, department line items uh, are now on Love Hatbox and they should be. So um, we just wanted to demonstrate for you the one difference uh, in this presentation versus 13 months ago and you can see what those <coughs> expenses look like here. Uh, and they equate to approximately $87,000. 13 months ago, we then um, presented our forecast for what the SFM managed operation was going to look like. And you can see that same net operating income line um, over that five year period, rather than a $1.1 million loss, um, we budgeted and forecasted just under $200,000 uh, in subsidy. 
um, you can see uh, in terms of goal number two, building a fin financially sustainable operation, that at year three, the end of year three, um, we end up at about cash neutral, and year four, we start to produce a surplus. That's what we forecasted um, 13 months ago. Um, the real bottom line is the economic impact uh, in terms of um, the, the direct spending that uh, is being brought into the market. So uh, actually, if you look back at the previous slide, historically, prior to our management, um, using the same exact formula, um, the city was generating $200,000 a year in economic impact. Again, accumulating over those five years to $1.1 million. We're forecasting an economic impact over those same five years of just under $22 million. This was um, the presentation 13 months ago. So the question is, how do we do in 2015 uh, against that forecast? Um, you can see column one is the actual results, column two is the forecast and the budget that we put in place. Um, so the net net on all of this, if you look at the net operating income, is that we missed the budget by $71,000. Um, and the economic impact, we actually exceeded um, by just under $100,000. Um, so the question I would be asking if I was at the city council, um, I would ask why did we miss the forecast by $71,000? And um, this is probably an image that uh, you all have seen before. <laughs> um, not, not here to make <coughs> excuses whatsoever, um, but we are operating an outdoor sports complex and uh, we did have record-setting rainfall last year. Uh, and uh, it caused us to miss $150,000 in booked revenue. Actual teams signed up to come in for events that we had to cancel. Uh, and obviously that's much more than the $71,000 um, that was missed. So this is the list of the um, tournaments and the events that we had to cancel and the number of teams that signed up. You can see the bottom line number is $150,000, so none of this is fuzzy math. These are real tournaments, real teams that were um, scheduled to come in. Um, nonetheless, um, despite that, that miss of $150,000, we still hit the economic impact. That's direct spending based on real teams coming in um, and, and spending time in market. So um, we're calculating that in the last year, over 19,000 non-local, non-residents to Muskogee um, visitors came in as a result of the Love Hatbox events that we ran. That generated over 4,500 hotel room nights um, as a result of the events that uh, we ran at Love Hatbox. So hopefully you're seeing that increase in your hotel um, tax uh, as well. So what does that mean for the next five years? How does that change our forecast? It really doesn't. Um, you can see here net operating income. You can see the highlighted years 17, 18, and 19. We're still demonstrating that at the end of the third year of 2017, we're going to build this to um, pretty much cash neutral, and in year four, um, we are going to be at a surplus. So we're continuing to lay the groundwork and um, make those steps forward that provide for us um, a long-term financially sustainable operation, unlike the trend that the city was on um, prior to our management. In addition to that, the economic impact you can see has been increased as a result of us beating that direct spending number by $100,000 um, this year. So it's just over $22 million now that we're forecasting over that five-year period in direct spending. Um, the way that we get to that direct spending and economic impact, just so you hear it, we can give you the full formula, but basically we look at the number of teams, participants, visitors or spectators that come with those participants, and then the spending that they spend in market um, when they're here. It's a pretty simple math formula. Um, so um, finally then, if you look at where that previous city trend was headed over the five-year period, you can see the net operating income loss of 1.1 million. You can see the economic impact of 1.1 million over those five years versus the trend that we're on right now um, demonstrates a $700,000 improvement in bottom line, cash, to the, <coughs> cash to, the, to the city, and then more importantly, I, I would argue, is the increase in economic impact. It's a 10 times increase over what um, the city was doing um, previously. Um, this also demonstrates the most recent financials that we have, um, the overall gross revenue increased by 500% over, um, over that 2013 number. And that was done without raising prices for local residents. We continue to rent the venue at the same prices um, that uh, the residents are used to um, um, renting the venue for. 
Um, so in summary, from an economic impact standpoint, um, you can see the number of tournaments, the number of teams, the number of participants. Of that attendance number of over 108,000 people, 19,000 again came from out of town and spent money inside the city that um, otherwise may not have. So goals three and four were about improving quality of the park and the guest experience. Um, this is a bit more subjective um, for this year's presentation. Um, this year we'd like to roll out a more formal survey so we can get a little bit more objective results on how our team's managing it. Um, so you can uh, hold us accountable for that in next year's presentation. Um, but, but we want to start by saying there is a lot of room for improvement still, operationally, in terms of the guest experience and the overall operation. That said, um, I'm personally very proud of the work that the team did on the ground here during a very difficult rainy season. Um, it was a really <coughs> a fine line between um, improving the fields and letting them rest and also making them playable and allowing teams to get on. And I believe that Neil and his team did a fantastic job of threading that needle. Um, we could nitpick, and there certainly are areas for improvement, including scheduling, field and facility maintenance, um, looking at the local user groups and providing better um, um, service to them, cleanliness, restrooms, concessions, and they're all on our list of a preventative maintenance plan um, for next year for sure. Um, but I do want to acknowledge for the council the work that Neil and his team have done this year. Um, I, I, I really do think it's extraordinary given the, uh, the rainfall and the weather that um, they had to manage. So in general, if you look at the four goals, and in, in summary, um, in terms of economic impact, we're exceeding the plan, uh, and we've taken a good step toward that financial sustainability, and we're still on pace to hit that at the end of year three. Um, all of that said, this year we had a 500% increase in top-line revenue. Um, to the park. We did make, um, thanks to the capital investment by this council, many capital improvements um, to improve the guest experience, even though some of them drug out longer than we wanted them to as a result of the rainy season and the weather. Um, we have um, gotten all of them done, and um, we're continuing to expand our programs, if you look at goal four, and uh, in an attempt to attract new people, um, new customers. <laughs> Uh, and um, we certainly had a good number of repeat um, customers. Our retention was really strong. So our go-forward plan, uh, as I mentioned, additional programming is coming on board. You can see those um, here. And the 2016 budget, which you saw in the five-year forecast, um, month over month, if you can read that small uh, print, you can <laughs> see uh, what that number looks like um, there. It's a good step, healthy step forward toward that financial sustainability. Um, the economic impact that we're projecting for the city is $2.2 million, uh, and that includes 21,000 non-local visitors and over 4,800 um, hotel room nights for 2016. Can we ask questions along the way? Sure, I'm done, so it's a perfect time. We've got about 170 or 80 new rooms coming on, uh, hotel, motel rooms coming on market before next season. Will that impact as well where they're staying in market now versus going out of market because rooms are not available? Will that help us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, the more inventory we have, um, the better it's going to be. The thing that we are projecting is an increased size of those events, right? So with the current inventory the way it was prior to these hotels coming out, we knew we could hit a maximum capacity pretty early on. Right. So it's nice to see these hotels being built because that will allow us to capture more as our events continue to grow. All right. Any other questions? We're really excited about the, uh, the vision in the future um, for Muskogee. I was joking with the team earlier. We <coughs> think the future is bright at Love Hat Box. As long as the rain stays away, it'll be very sunny. What about <coughs> the customer service uh, component? Uh, during the initial presentation, it was alluded to that you would have um, customer service feedback surveys that would be provided to council. I'm not seeing any of that data. Yeah, that's what Jason was referring to. Uh, we are currently working on rolling out that plan, and we can definitely present that to council um, prior to next year's presentation. Um, we did a great job of collecting the data of who we can send those surveys out to. It's just formulating those surveys, getting them out, and getting them back to you. Overall, I can talk generally about the feedback that we received from the park. Um, a lot of positive feedback uh, from users that came over and over again, but certainly heard things that we need to improve on. And one thing that we really strive on is uh, or like got to build our foundation on is taking those complaints, things that happen in the park very seriously and working quickly to, to remedy those so they don't happen again. 
I think if you talk to any of the users that use the park this year, um, we can definitely back that up. So within the first year, we've done no, no formal survey process of our customers? No, no we didn't send out a, a formal survey yet. I'm very disappointed in that, that we would not do that. Not a box or anything. We have that. We have a process for receiving it, and, and Neil has received uh, a number of feedback, and we review it every single month with him. Um, and there's formality to that process, but we haven't sent out proactively a questionnaire survey, and that's what Steve's uh, alluding to. So we do receive cards, feedback, and that sort of thing um, that comes through Neil's office, but um, we have not sent out the formal process <coughs> via SurveyMonkey digitally so that it can um, – track all of the metrics in, in, in terms of areas for improvement, which we will have. That's one of our strategic objectives for this year. Yeah, we, we did receive and actually uh, asked for Neil, could you, could you go to the microphone? We did receive feedback from current user groups. Um, it, it was a little difficult at first to get it to us as we got right into operations into the season. So we got more towards the end of the season than early in the season. Um, but w we did um, seek some feedback and get some feedback. Um, going forward, though, we're actually coming up with those processes and procedures that they just talked about to actually solicit more of that and get them back in a more um, database format so we can actually and, – and, and better metrics to, to take care of that going forward. Did that answer the question? Yeah. How quickly can we receive that, I, I guess? Because to me, the, the, what's very important for us to know if we're moving forward in a more positive light, to know it, it, are we improving the customer service uh, in the park? Yeah, I there. can give you what we, what we had. Uh, instead of hearsay, are we really no, it's seeing? Good. It's good because we want to proactively get in front of it too because generally – um, the squeaky wheel is what you know gets the oil, and at this point, when you're reactive to it, you hear the negative feedback. And Absolutely, I'm going to hear the complaints. Yeah, that's but I right. would really like to see the data on, on you know overall. And if we have nothing at all, <coughs> all we're going to hear is you know the, the negative. negative. Yeah, that's right. So what we will um, we can commit to is we can move that up forward in the year. Here we've got the database to send it all out to. So we'll formulate that survey, and I think within the first quarter here, okay, um, of the calendar year we can have something sent out to the users and start to collect that feedback. Excellent. Yeah. Are there things such as the plumbing issue kind of not getting resolved on the softball area? Is, is, are there things like that over these winter months that we can address versus waiting until almost end of the season that, uh, yeah, that need to be addressed? Yeah, and we worked with facilities maintenance to, to try to clear that up. I know that, um, and, and Larry could probably speak to a lot of it uh, a little better than I could. I know they've replaced some toilets. They've replaced some items. I can't really speak to, you know, what they've done plumbing inside the building other than, you know, just, just replacing the toilets and, and, and making a lot of that better. I know we've been trying to be proactive going forward for this year so that what we experienced as we increased participation out at the park, because it really hit us in June, July. The, the wet months, we didn't have the number of people coming through there because we lost a lot of events. It really hit us when it finally dried out at the end of June, July. Um, and then that's when we found we had a little strain on the, the resources. So we've been proactive trying to get that done before we start back up here in, in March. Okay. okay. I just want to be sure we're doing it before we get to season so we don't tear up the ground and then, you know, well, end of season doing that kind of stuff. I probably was one of those squeaky wheels that they were talking about because I used the facility out there with our Little League football program. But overall, I was imp impressed with the way they took care of our fields and the facilities was nice. The restrooms were well maintained, at least at the beginning of our games, not <laughs> so much at the end. And that's not their fault. That was due to 100 little, 500 little kids running in and out of them. But overall, um, I had very few complaints. And if I did have something that needed to be addressed, they addressed it. I will tell you that much. Uh, for is what I had for my dealings with uh, SFM, I didn't have any overall complaints that were too bad. The first meeting that I sat down with, and I don't know where it was in those meetings, but it was kind of a mid-year operations meeting, they had heard very little feedback from us as to what the issues were. I said, well, what about this one, this one, this one, and this one? They were not even aware of it. So, I mean, we've got to be sure that we're not just hearing information and then not giving information to them to operate and react to. 
and I think we had kind of dropped the ball maybe on that uh, issue. And then I know the plumbing issue I was talking about, you had turned in several service requests, maybe three or four, and we still didn't have it. We've got to react faster to those kind of things that affect public safety and health. Uh, it, in well. it was probably our best year. I mean, we've been doing this for eight years. It was probably my best year out there. Ooh, I like hearing that. So it was, I mean, there was a couple of things with some like, um, uh, yeah, moles, which is we can't, I mean, they had traps all over the place trying to catch these little guys. from Florida too. Yeah, it's Florida's <laughs> fault. But, I mean, but they tried to fix the fields and everything. But other than the mole issue, I mean, it was probably out of the eight years that we've been using it out there, the cleanest, the most productive that we could have it. Everything was in the right place. We didn't have to go find things. Uh, and there was, all, there was someone on duty. And I liked yeah. that. I had liked having someone out there in case we had an issue. I did like that. I do think the hotel motel tax uh -huh. being up, whatever it is, 12.8% or 13% basically is pretty well directly attributable to you all helping generate overnight stays. And we're pleased at that, as well as the 500% revenue change. And I just want you to remember, I was one of the people that voted no for him, so. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're the one who brought that up. Okay. Well, you're, you're, so, Nobody so, else was giving you a bad time about it. So, uh, Jason, do you all actually have a program of work to, to improve the customer experience and based off of what we did? Is there any way you all can kind of share that? That way when we are out in the public and they go, well, what are they getting last year, da, 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 da. I'd like to be able to go, yes, they're aware of it, and, and they're planning on taking care of it. Is there a way we can kind of have some program of work so we can, you know, we'll inform our constituents of, of what's going on and yeah. what the future plans are? Absolutely. In July, we had about to do a mid-year review. At that point, we had put together an action plan based on what we had heard back and what we were doing to implement in that action plan that covered all those areas. Mm -hmm. And that's been a dynamic document that we continue to add to and then add plans to that. We'd be happy to share that with council. Yeah, and I, I think we could. Maybe like a talking points? You know, when you're just out eating something? lunch, somebody will Elevator go, speech? hey, we were out at Love Hat Box and yada, sure. yada, yada. And I'd like to be able to go, oh, the bathrooms, yes, it's on the list of things to do. And, you know, so at least let know that we acknowledge it and there is a plan to fix some of these issues and go forward. And then I'd like to have a place that if we do hear something, who do we give it to? Do we give it to city manager? Mm -hmm. Do we give it to Neil? Procedure. What's the process if I hear something that I think is valid to forward it on to you? I'd like to see, know what the process is that. Cause Great. But we can help formalize that. Obviously, we, we want to be um, the keeper of all those solutions. That's why you've hired mm -hmm. us so that um, we can handle the feedback that you're getting. I mean, you all don't have to anymore. Um, so we will formalize that and get that out to you. Absolutely. I mean, That's a great request. Neil's so busy. I mean, I've, we've tried to meet him a couple of times, and you know, there's a lot of going on. And so I hate to just go, oh, I heard this, and take up 20, 30 minutes of his time. I'd like to have a little quick okay. process to kind of know because he's got his hands full. <laughs> That's, yeah, no, no question. He's busy. Okay. I would just like to say one thing. Um, I, I can't fix it if I don't hear about it. So yep. I, I try to tell everybody, if you have an issue, Everybody wants to strive to make the park bigger. I mean, we're trying to increase utilization. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you increase utilization. You make a misstep in customer service. I can't fix what I don't know about. So right. the one thing I tell everybody is please um, let, let <coughs> us know what we can do and do better because that's the only way that we can make a proactive plan to get it fixed. So, uh, you know. So you're giving us your cell number and we just text you? I think everybody's <laughs> got it. but <laughs> not. <laughs> I leave Which you one alone, of their brother? cell phone numbers do y'all want? <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and – that's why I brought up the tool. You know, there really should be a tool and a resource because you're going to hear the big complaints, but really you should be hearing, you know, hey, you need to sell this in the concession area. We need to hear those good things that we can improve and get better sales and get better revenue and, and, and the good things that's going on at Love Hat Box. You know, those are the right. things that we need to be hearing about. Uh, you know, you're going to hear about the negative things, but we also need to hear about the things that we're doing right and the things that we need to do better, that we're going to generate better revenue, and some of those suggestions that we hadn't even thought about. So that's, uh, there, there's tools and there's resources, and that's what I was, you know, kind of disappointed that we had, you know, it's been a year and we don't have that tool out there. Yep. So I, I'm, I appreciate you coming back, and in the first quarter we'll have that tool available to us. Count on it. Any additional questions for Jason or Nick or any of the staff? I certainly appreciate all of the financials, particularly 
projecting that we're right on path for what the council had anticipated would happen if we took the risk to go this direction. But I think my question is for Mr. Tucker uh, internally. When we receive projections with forecasts from private uh, organizations that say here's where we're on target to go, is there a way on the city side that we could qualify them so that we might be able to relate them to what our numbers are actually showing in terms of their actual production? Do you mean a way to check them with? In other words, if company XYZ says we're going to make a million dollars, is there a way on the city side to say, yes, based on this, this, and this, they're fairly accurate and correct? Some of the, th uh, in some ways, we can do that. For example, um, they've indicated the direct um, impact that they've had on mm -hmm. hotel rooms. Right. Um, we can verify um, what our increase has been in hotel rooms. For example, September of 2015, when compared to September of 2014, the increase for that month, just as an example, was up 60%. Mm -hmm. So. That is an example of an right. indicator. Because it makes a better um, selling point for us on our side when we can say clearly what they are saying is accurate because here's how we can demonstrate mm -hmm. what we've been told. But there are some other factors that they use, and it's a determination based upon um, individuals who come, and there's a formula based upon how many dollars that they spend per day. Mm -hmm. That is harder to verify. Right. Um, but there are some things that we can verify, such as with hotel motel tax. When they're talking mm -hmm. about hotel rooms, we can verify whether there is an increase, just as like I've said before. Right. Um, and then we can um, make a determination whether there are, um, if they have a large tournament, we can mm -hmm. uh, kind of gear down to, t to determine whether there was a substantial increase in fuel taxes. Some of those types of things, if we know enough in advance, because that takes a substantial amount of research right. to be able to drill down those numbers, and we can certainly do that. Now, hotel motel tax, that's fairly easy to mm -hmm. be able to ascertain, but when we're getting into um, additional taxes that uh, we don't get um, at the same time, uh, and that may be several months off, um, for example, our sales tax comes in two months in arrears. Mm -hmm. And so when we're talking about January, that's going to correspond with their November. Right. And so we have to be careful that we, that we make those adjustments necessary. But no, we, we can um, uh, provide you with some um, uh, matching numbers to, to mm -hmm. help uh, with that, to adjust it. Don, did you have something you wanted to add? I just wanted to say that I, I know Mark does this, and I do it for my projects. We review on a monthly basis, Councilman Coleman, to see if our contractors are hitting the mark. Mm -hmm. In other words, we're not going to wait a year from now to see if, uh, if these guys hit the revenue issue because I know they review that with Mark all the time. So there should be trends that, that are seen as we go through the year. Are we gonna make it or aren't we gonna make it and what are we gonna do to adjust and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So Mark and I both do that on a regular basis with the folks that we work with, whether it's Spectre or over at the Roxy or, or out at you know, Hatbox. You know, we're doing that on a regular basis. And that's fine. To see if we're getting there. So if we're yeah, not, then you guys right, won't yeah. get a surprise. Right. And the reason why I ask is because it makes a, a very positive talking point for voters if we can explain to them that even though they don't see the return on investment on the front end, that they are making headway, making sure that overall it's met. Yeah. We, if they're performing the plan, which we check, you know, then, that, you know, we're going to hit the mark then. Thank you. Any additional questions? So what are we asked to do are we just receiving a report or receiving I know it's some recommendation it's approved the proposed operating plan and staffing budget is that what we're looking at or are we, just we, we will need the 2016 operating budget approved um, which I can go that's okay um, which I, I don't think we formalized that request um, to you in preparation for this meeting so that could be something that you do Okay. Um, in your next session. All right, so okay. we can take no action on this, and then we'll put the budget on for our, because um, this is in committee, we'll put the uh, formal budget request for our special for our city council meeting on Monday night. Sounds good. Thank you. All right, thank you, guys. Thanks for everyone's time. Thank you. Item number four, please. Consider approval of awarding bid for trailer-mounted diesel-driven self-priming centrifugal pump with auto start to the sole bidding, bidder Normco Energy Products in the amount of $35,800 or take other necessary action. Recognizing Mrs. Stewart. 
Actually, uh, Mr. Kingston is going to come up, and, and he's been working on this item, and he's going to give you a presentation. Tell me about this Chairman, <laughs> committee, uh, this is an item for our uh, pollution control plant. It's a very needed tool. It's uh, some of these when they have a uh, issue at a uh, lift station. Uh, we've had um, it's a capital outlay budgeted item. We had uh, one one bidder. We sent out at least four packets, and we got a reply from another one who apparently they. One of their personnel had dropped the, the ball, but gave us a quote that was like $4,500 over the one bid we did re receive. And uh, the bid beat all of our specifications and uh, I would recommend for approval. Any questions? Move for approval. Second. second. Have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Roll call, please. Deputy Mayor James Gully. Yes. Janie Boydston. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Leanne Langston. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. Item, item four passed. Item number five, please. Consider approval of best bid from Crawford Roofing Incorporated in the amount of $176,919 to re roof the Muskogee Public Library or take other necessary action. Recognizing Mr. Garvin. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, this is for the roof replacement at the Muskogee Public Library. As you know, the City of Muskogee hired a consultant, uh, R. Edward Owen, to inspect, design, and prepare a scope of work for the... Hold on. Okay. That ain't better? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we did hire a consultant, uh, Mr. Owen, and he was to uh, inspect, design, and prepare a scope of work for the roof replacement of the Muskogee Public Library. He did put together a scope of work. Uh, we went out for bids. Uh, originally, all the bids submitted were rejected. We then revised the scope of work and went out for bids a second time. Those bids were opened on January the 6th, 2016. We received five bids. All five bids were reviewed by both the consultant and city staff. Uh, the consultant is recommending approval of the best bid to Crawford Roofing in the amount of 176919 and that is for a re-roof of the Muskogee Public Library. Uh, the new roof will have a 30-year warranty and a four-inch hail warranty. <coughs> now, Mr. Crawford was not the low bid. Uh, he was $11,419 higher than the low bid. However, the low bidder is not certified to install this type oh, of roof sure. system. Also, the low bidder had a 90-day completion date and yeah. only a three-inch hail warranty, where Mr. Crawford had a 60-day completion date and a four-inch hail warranty and is certified to install the roof. <coughs> So with that being said, uh, both staff and consultant is recommended approval of the best bid to Crawford in the amount of 176,919. Uh, Mr. Owen, uh, the consultant is present. If you have any questions on the roof design or his recommendation, I'd ask him to come to the podium and address those questions. Otherwise, I'd recommend approval and also the purchasing committee has recommended approval. Would like to ask, will there be inspections during the uh, installation process? by the consultant. What was the question? Uh, will you be doing in inspections during the installation process yes. Yes. as part of your services? Yes. Okay. Appreciate that. Uh, it, I'm really pleased to see this. I mean, uh, as you know, the, the original roof was put in a, a, a a repair or uh, over a bad roof. Um, I, I'm, this is a complete tear off, uh, new insulation, new roof over it. Uh, but you can put a, a roof is only as good as the installation process. So that's why an inspection during the installation is very important. So I appreciate that very much. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further questions? Yes, I was just wondering. <coughs> you said about not being certified. How do you get certified? How would like the the lowest bid? He would have to go to the manufacturer and get certified. It's understanding that the next class is not available until April, and then they're not sure if there will be room to add that contractor to get that certification. So there's some unknowns whether he could get certified this year. So you have to go to I class. I think they or? just have the class actually too. I think they just have it once a year. But April's the next time, and and they're not sure they have the openings to get that roofing contractor in. Okay. And I if he's not certified, I think it would affect the warranty. I spoke with the contractor that had the low bid, and he has not installed a roof with this manufacturer 
the uh, achieved a warranty. Yeah, this will be the first first roof with a warranty with this manufacturer. So uh, my concern is he's going to be out there and his crew is going to be out there in a terrible learning curve. And you know, uh, I expect that that the other contractor that we recommended is uh, very well trained, very well skilled. They do this type of work all the time, and uh, we we expect an excellent performance out of out of them. We we really don't know. We haven't. The, the low bid was turned in by a general contractor that's not his prime business is not roofing, whereas the other contractor is a roofing contractor, and that's his his uh, only business. But this. Uh, product uh, requires some special installation equipment to put the adhesive down to uh, achieve the four inch uh, hail warranty. There's a special adhesive that is required and the equipment to apply that adhesive is rather expensive. So you know, once uh, a business has the investment in that equipment uh, they're going to want to do a lot of that type of roof to justify and, and make that equipment pay for itself. So uh, 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 without that special adhesive, uh, the same roof membrane material will only achieve a three-inch hail warranty. So by using this, uh, this other type of adhesive, we're able to get a four-inch hail warranty. So we, we uh, think this is the, the best quality roof that money can buy in this marketplace. And, it, uh, you know, and we think that the contractor that we recommended is one of the best contractors in the state of Oklahoma for installing this product. Well, thank you, sir, for explaining this to me. Because we need definitely a good contractor to do that roof and the best. What's that? I said we definitely need a good contractor and, and one of the best contractors to do this real thing. But I, I yeah. you know, I was just my question, you know. So thank you for explaining it to me. Yes, sir. All right, we have a motion, a second. Yes. We're ready for the roll call, please. Deputy Mayor James Gully. Yes. Janie Boydston. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Leanne Langston. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. Item five passed. Item number six, please. Consider approval of the purchase of two vehicles, one one-half ton extended cab 4x4 four four pickup in the amount of $25,455 and one three-quarter ton cab pickup 4x4 four four in the amount of $25,340 for the Public Works Department or take other necessary action. Recognize it, Mr. Swifton. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the Council. Staff went out for bids for two vehicles for the Public Works Department. Five bids, including the lowest state contract bid, were received and are listed on your tabulation sheet. Of these, we are recommending the low bid on both. The half-ton extended cab four-wheel drive will be to Bob Howard Dodge in the amount of $25,455. The three-quarter ton truck would be Bob Hurley Ford on state contract of $25,340. It is budgeted in this year's capital outlay budget and Public Works has been consulted on this and they agree with the recommendations from the Fleet Department. So we recommend approval. Be happy to answer any questions. You gonna have them by Thursday? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> the first no. <laughs> Move for approval. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any other questions? Roll call, please. Deputy Mayor James Gully. Yes. Janie Boydston. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Leanne Langston. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. All right. Item six pass. Item number seven. Consider approval of amending the change order number one to the contract with Timco Blasting and Coating for the resurfacing of River Country Water Park in the amount of $5,000 or take other necessary action. Recognize it, Mr. Wembley. Council and Chairman. Larry and I, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is going. Larry and I are trying to help you understand why we are making a change, amending this change order number one. The change order number one went to the city council on April the 27, 2015, and this was for the water park pool uh, rehab. 
due to the clerical error, the change order number one was uh, wrong. It should have been $19,493 and not $14,943 that was asked to the council by Jean Travell. So that left us a balance owing Tim Blaston $5,000. And Larry will go into detail explaining the background of this history here. Thank you, I'll try to be brief. Um, what happened was um, we went out with a scope of work to um, remove all the existing paint and, um, and, re and replace it with new paint. When we got into the work itself, got into the sandblasting, started removing the existing paint, the, um, it was deteriorating the bottom of the pool to the point where going back with paint was not going to be a feasible option. So we stopped work, we went back to the installer, we went back to some uh, pool experts that we knew, um, looked into other options. Finally, um, we decided that the best option for the pool long term would be to scrap the idea of painting and go back with plaster. Um, it would provide a more durable finish, a more long lasting finish. Uh, unfortunately, plaster is about four times more expensive than paint so we had to come in with a change order uh, since they were removing the paint from the original um, bid they gave us a, um, a credit so to speak of five thousand um, dollars and it took brought it back from the original 29 and change to 24 and change <clears throat> well me personally not knowing how the system works and uh, Gene not knowing how the system works we just did the math and said okay we're getting a credit for you know we're, we're five thousand dollars over here we need nineteen thousand dollars and he came in and wrote up a change <coughs> order for fourteen thousand um, dollars and uh, and that's what got approved and um, through the scheme of things, we ended up paying them for the sandblasting alone, which was the amount of the 24000 And then they came in and did the plaster work, and uh, you know we paid them the, the 14000 because that's what the amount of the change order was. And, uh, and now here we are where we still have that $5,000 hanging out there that from the original estimates and the original statements from them that we owe them. So you're asking us for, to amend change order one to uh, pay an additional $5,000, correct? Yes, ma'am. So moved. Second. Was this the, uh, I got a question for you, Larry. Yes, sir. And I know this has nothing to do with you as a working here. Was this the uh, original repair where the concrete or something in the bottom of the pool wasn't to standard at the time that we put it in or something? Is there something like that? When they started sandblasting, it was not to standard or something. Well, and we're we, we, fixing that now. Uh, sorry. Yes, we um, we came up with some unexpected realizations. Um, it had been the understood knowledge of everybody involved that we had a um, a solid concrete swimming pool. Uh, when we got into it and started doing the sandblasting and whatnot, we found out that it was a gunite shell on top of concrete. So. In the planning phases, uh, it, it, it didn't make any difference. We had to get the sand off, but it was an unexpected realization when we got into it and found the pitting and found the damage that the sandblasting was was okay. causing. Okay, I was just making shell. sure that I was just making sure that that's what we were still talking about. If there was something else that came up in some in another case, but that's the original issue that we had. Okay, yeah. thank you, sir. You're welcome. Any additional questions? Roll call, please. Deputy Mayor James Gully. Yes. Janie Boydston. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Leanne Langston. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. All right. Item seven passed. Item number eight. Consider approval of a resolution of community financial support for the proposed downtown microbrewery and restaurant project with the original town site or take other necessary action. Mr. Root. Mr. Chairman, Council. Uh, I, put, I brought this issue up before the Economic Development Task Force to see if they were um, in favor 
of coming forward and to assist the microbrewery in giving them or deeding over to them the old fire station. And I got an affirmative vote from the task force. So I brought to the city attorney's office and uh, Matt suggested that we go this route with a resolution that would first express our intent to do that. And then if that is agreeable, then we'll follow that up with an economic development agreement in which we'll specify uh, exactly what's required in terms of performance on their side. Um, so that's what you have in front of you is the intent document. And then we'll, if you like that, then we'll bring forward the other document that has all the details involved with their performance and how we actually end up deeding the, the property over to them. So be happy to answer any questions. I would say one thing. Uh, I got a call from their bank today. Their uh, term sheet's in the process of being formulated, so we should have something pretty soon. So hopefully we'll have that when I bring the development agreement forward. So any questions? Move for approval. Second. second. Motion and a second. Any further questions? Roll call, please. Deputy Mayor James Gully. Yes. Janie Boydston. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Leanne Langston. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. Item 8 passed. Item number 9. Consider approval of Martin Luther King Jr. Community Center facility rental policies and rental rules, rates, or take other necessary action. Mr. Root. Okay. It's, um, uh, this has been a lot of hard work by the facilities board. Um, I think they have, this is what they've spent almost their exclusive attention on since they were, were formed. This is the facility rental policy. There's a couple of little changes. It's now called the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Community Center. We put the doctor on the front of it. And we did get a uh, MLK address. It's 300 MLK Street. So I thought that was important. Uh, this document comes, we started with some uh, document, policies from other cities. We've picked the one that we like the best. We've been modifying and working it um, to come up with the document that you see in front of you today. Um, the mission statement, I think, is real important. I'm not going to read it to you, but uh, you, you can see what it is. It's really for the benefit uh, of the city in its entirety. Uh, beautiful center that we have, almost ready. Uh, this is This will be the rental facility policy. This will be followed up with the uh, agreements that we're going to put in place for how it'll be operated. But this is the start. This is how it'll operate. And so I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, well, Councilman Johnson can answer <laughs> any questions you might have. So he prepared a lot of this document. Uh, <coughs> anyway. Question on item 14, should that not say tobacco use or whatever versus smoking? We can make that change. Yeah. Would that be correct, Wayne? To I'd have to get to that item. To correct item that number is. 14. The smoking is not permitted. Yeah. Yes, that would need to be revised to reflect what our current policy is. <laughs> Including yeah, vaping? We, we want to yes. add the, the restriction on vaping as well that was just <laughs> passed. Yes. So we can, we'll make that consistent with the, the way the the policies are here at the city? Yep. Uh, that being amended, I would recommend approval. I move to approve. Second. Meant to say. Question. With the, is there a projected revenue stream and <coughs> expense stream on this based on these established rates if these pass? We, we had done <coughs> some projections on that. Um, we, we don't have it in front of you tonight, but we can do that later on. Um, well, we just don't have that. We did a, a, a bit of a pro forma, yeah. Mr. Mayor, and uh, so we projected revenues. Uh, we projected expenses. Um, the, the center is not self-sustaining. <laughs> the city is going to have to put some money into the deal. Right, if you yeah, will. but where we were using 5,000 square feet, now we have 19,000 square feet. It's going to be Does a bigger job to operate. The Expenses will be more. We're still paying the utilities. I mean, we have a pro forma that we can present. Okay. Well, I don't think we built the facility to make money off of it. I think we built it for our community and the community use out of it. So I understand there's some money that we can make off of it, but I don't think that was the reason we built it, though. 
Yeah, and I'm right. not submitting that we would make money on it. I'm just saying how big is the hole going to be, you know. We, we can report that to you. I'd be happy okay. to do that. We, the, there is a performer that reflects what we think uh, the financials will look yes. like. We're in the midst of putting together the <coughs> contract with neighbors building neighborhoods, so it hasn't been fully uh, okay. negotiated. And so there may be a few changes, but we can give you a, kind of a ballpark. I'd be happy to do that. I'll do, can I do that when I bring the contract forward? Oh, sure. Would that be yeah. fine? As okay. far as I'm concerned, yes. Okay. And Mr. Johnson, if I'm not mistaken, we did go into some detail with that pro forma in reviewing it that it did account for some of the hole that we would see. Absolutely. Yes. And, and actually, the performer is, is really pretty good. I mean, right. uh, uh, again, it's a community center. Um, and, and as you look at these rental rates, um, I mean, these are not like it, it was at the Martin Luther King Center. Um, you know, it, it, we really tried to take the, the, the middle of the road mm -hmm. at really making sure. Um, and one, I want to express my appreciation to our chair that's, that's here to represent the committee um, and, um, and to everyone that served on that committee because really um, there was a ton of work that went into this and everybody mm -hmm. took a piece of it and we looked at every community center in our and and different facilities inside our community and how much are they renting for and we tried to bring all those rates together and we wanted to be mm -hmm. competitive with like facilities in our community and say what are they renting for and saying okay we want to be competitive uh, but we want to make sure we're available to our community too and uh, Mr. Van can tell you, sometimes we, we really disagree that we think it needs to be for free in some events, and yet <laughs> we want to, uh, but we've got to also make a performer because we can't be for free because it's not going to be for free. It's going to cost somebody, and it can't cost the city. It can't cost our taxpayers. It has to make sure that we're breaking even. So, so we'll bring back some information that would be very helpful to council on where that performer is because we are just around the corner of that facility being open. And I want to commend you and the committee also because I think compared to other communities, what we've done is make certain that we can have an, a facility that's accessible and affordable through that pro forma. And that's not the common trend uh, that other cities have taken. And I think what you all did put Muskogee in the lead again uh, to be certain that we're making uh, every effort to give what our community deserves in a way that they can also afford it. So well, that's thank all of you. committee chair here that's, uh, that's kept us on track. And a beautiful facility at that. Mm -hmm. I'd like to uh, <coughs> say that I'd like to see that the, the committee stand, please, so we can see who they are, if they don't mind. Let's give them a hand. I'm on that facilities board, like Mr. Johnson says, and I learned a lot, too, and they've taught me a lot, and I'm just proud of them, and like I say, I'm glad the Martin Luther King Center is moving forward, and thanks to the members of the committee, it is. So they, they are to be praised, and along with Mr. Johnson, he's done a wonderful job on doing things, and along with Ms. Boyati, all the committee. Well, our committee chair, Bernalene Bogatti, has been yes. a uh, tireless at making sure we have stayed on task yep. and especially with this rental facility um have been is that what added. you call it wayne <laughs> uh, facility rental uh, i mean oh, it, she was <laughs> it has just been uh, at it because um it's been a long process uh, but we really believe uh, that this is the best way to move forward at, at martin luther king center and we're right on time because we're really close to opening it's exciting times. Yeah, Perlina has kept us on track. That's right. <laughs> Great leadership. <laughs> Whatever you think that means, but <laughs> she has kept us on track moving forward. He's going to teach the rest of us forward. how to keep him in hand. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do we have any other questions? Ready for the roll call? Deputy Mayor James Gully. Yes. Janie Boydston. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Leanne Langston. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. I'm a abstaining due to my future role in the Martin Luther King Center. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. Item number nine passed. Item number 10.
consider approval of receiving donated funds for the months of November 2015 in the amount of $35 and December 2015 in the amount of $1,475.20 for a total of $1,510.20 for the city's animal shelter sponsorship program as per the attached list or take other necessary action. Chief Hendricks. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is part of a regular report that we present based on the donations that we receive. We usually do this report on a bi-monthly uh, basis. Uh, the month of November, as uh, Ms. Bates said, or Ms. Bates, I'm sorry, I thought Ms. Bush for a moment. Um, $35 for November and $14.75.20 for December for a total of $15.10.20. So I would ask council to receive these funds. Move for approval. Second. Motion and a second. Any further questions? Roll call, please. Deputy Mar uh, Mayor James Gully. Yes. Janie Boydston. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Leanne Langston. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. Item 10 passed. Item number 11, please. Consider approval of the appointment of C. Bart Fight as municipal judge to serve a full two-year term beginning February 1, 2016 and ending January 31, 2018, unless sooner removed for cause pursuant to Section 34-89 of the Muskogee City Code or take other necessary action. Mayor Coburn. The, uh, this particular item, number 11 and 12, 13, and 14, are all confirmation of our judges or at least uh, offered for confirmation. And uh, Bart Fight as municipal judge is the first of those, and I move for his uh, confirmation. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Deputy Mayor James Gully. Yes. Janie Boydston. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Leanne Langston. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. Item 11 passed. Item number 12. Consider approval of the appointment of Brett Smith as the first alternate municipal judge and juvenile judge to serve a full two-year term beginning February 2nd, 2016 and ending January 31st, 2018 unless sooner removed for cause pursuant to Section 34-89 of the Muskogee City Code or take other necessary action. Mayor Coburn. Again, the same thing. Brett Smith is first alternate municipal judge and juvenile judge. And I've visited the courtrooms of both fight, uh, Judge Fight and, and Judge Smith. And uh, and I move for their uh, for his confirmation as well. Second, motion and a second. Any further discussion? I'd like to make a comment. Uh, by the same respect, uh, I had had a couple of uh, concerns expressed about uh, Judge Smith, and I'd called Roy, and uh, Roy said uh, just visit the courtroom. I visited on two occasions, and I, I just want to I just want to express my appreciation to to Judge Smith. Um, and uh, especially on the juvenile uh, court system, uh, it's very impressive about what's going on in our juvenile court system and about how things are being handled. And uh, I, it, it, it's very uh, interesting about what. And I think it, I would encourage other council members to, to just sit down there a couple of days, a couple of times. I'll pass that word along to them. I'm sure they appreciate hearing that. Uh, that's why I wanted to just make that comment. Okay. It uh, it gives you insight, but uh, they're doing it. Uh, Brent Smith doing a great job. Mr. Tucker, along those same lines, has anything been done to address the backlog that happens with the juvenile court? Because there are many Thursdays <coughs> that those parents and their young people almost out the door trying to get into the court. <clears throat> our logs have been reduced so significantly that juvenile court is no, not only is, has been reduced from once a week every Thursday to now uh, every other Thursday, and so we shouldn't have a, we don't have a backlog anymore. Okay. So uh, we've been very pleased, uh, and that's of course um, a great part of the credit to uh, Brett Smith, but also um, to our school system mm -hmm. uh, for handling a lot of the discipline uh, in house. And I'd like to take some of the credit for our community service program mm -hmm. right. to be able to get some of the, uh, those who were assigned community service in and out of the system, too. So I think it's been, it was a perfect storm of things that just went right. I would like to add to that. Our school system is, our kids are acting wonderful, so we don't have to do that mm -hmm. discipline on the inside anymore. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> that's why. Our kids are not causing any problems, so that's why. <laughs> All right, I think we have a motion and a second. <coughs> Roll call, please. Deputy Mayor James Scully. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> Janie Boydston. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Leanne Langston. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. Item 12 passed. Item number 13. A consider approval of the appointment of Drew Wilcoxon as second alternate municipal judge to serve a full two-year term beginning February 1st, 2016 and ending January 31st, 2018 unless sooner removed for cause pursuant to Section 34-89 of the Muskogee City Code or take other necessary action. Uh, this item would be for confirmation uh, recommendation of Drew Wilcoxon as second alternate municipal judge and I move for his confirmation. Second. Okay. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Deputy Mayor James Gully. Yes. Janie Boydston. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Leanne Langston. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Uh, yes. Item 13 passed. Item number 14. Consider approval of the appointment of Tony Bradley Smith as third alternate municipal judge to serve a full two year term beginning February 2nd, 2016, and ending on January 31st, 2018, unless sooner removed for cause pursuant to Section 34 89 of the Muskogee City Code or take other necessary action. Mayor Coburn. Again, this becomes our third alternate municipal judge, uh, Tony Bradley Smith, and I move for her confirmation. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Deputy Mayor James Gully. Yes. Jenny Boydston. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Leanne Langston. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. All right, item 14 passed, and that was the final item, so the Finance Committee is adjourned. And we'll now call to order the Public Works Committee meeting. Item 1, when you're ready, Pam. Consider approval of Public Works Committee minutes of January 5th, 2016. Additions or changes? Move for approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Roll call. Deputy Mayor James Scully. Yes. Janie Boydston. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Leanne Langston. Yes. Ivy Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. And the motion carries. Item number two. Consider approval of a preliminary and final plat of Quattro Muskogee edition consisting of one lot on block uh, zero four acres located on the north side of Shawnee Avenue, west of Spruce Avenue, or take other necessary action. Mr. Garvin. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, the applicant FLC investment is requesting approval of a preliminary and final plat of Quattro Muskogee edition, consisting of one lot on .40 acres. The property is located on the north side of Shawnee uh, between Spruce uh, Avenue and the River Plaza Shopping Center. Uh, here's a Aerial that kind of shows you the location. The area outlined in red is the site. You can see the location of <coughs> Freddy's, Mednow, River City Plaza, the new Aldi's. Uh, the apartment complex is to the rear, straight across the road from the Urban Renewal Authority or Urban Renewal Area. Uh, the reason for plating the property is allowed to be developed commercially. They are required to extend a sewer main to serve the property. And you can see the area outlined in yellow, which is the location of the sewer main. It's coming from behind to the north of the property from the apartments, extending over to the site. Uh, this item has been reviewed and recommended for approval by staff, subdivision review committee, and planning commission. Be glad to answer any questions. Move for approval. Second. second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Roll call. Deputy Mayor James Gully. Yes. Jenny Boydston. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Leanne Langston. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. The motion carries. Mr. Know. Chairman. Oh. Can I be excused, oh, please? Sure. Yeah, I'm sorry. I have class tonight. Thank Learn you. Learn something. Okay. <laughs> Do your homework. <laughs> <laughs> Item number three. Consider authorizing the mayor to sign the NOI for stormwater discharges from small municipal separate storm sewer systems under OPDES general permit OKR04 OK or take other necessary action. Mr. Stewart. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, committee, we're just simply asking for authorization for the mayor to sign our notice of intent uh, to renew our stormwater permit. Uh, we intend to uh, bring a full uh, presentation to the committee when our stormwater program is actually uh, finalized and, and we submit uh, but for now all we're asking for is the mayor to authorize the uh, the uh, NOI so that for, for the mayor's signature to be authorized so we can send that in uh, we're a phase two community uh, we have been under a permit since 2005 it was a five-year permit it expired in 2010 it took uh, the Environmental Protection Agency and, and uh, ODEQ five more years to uh, finalize the second version of that, and that's what we're now uh, applying for. 
So as soon as we do have that program uh, completed, we'll bring it and give you a presentation. Uh, we've been having uh, daily meetings on it uh, with Ron Bladen, Abby Wright, Francie Martin, Prague, George Kingston, and myself. Uh, we just about have that uh, finalized. It's just a, a continuation of our first five-year program with some changes and some modifications that were required under the new permit. So recommend approval to uh, authorize the mayor's signature. Move the approval. Second. A motion and a second. Any questions or discussion? Roll call. Deputy Mayor James Gully. Yes. Jenny Boydston. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Leanne Langston. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. The motion carries. Item number four. Consider approval of accepting ODEQ permit number WL 00005115893 for the construction of 3,800 linear feet of two and a half inch water line to serve West 43rd Street South, Muskogee County, Oklahoma, or take out a necessary action. Mr. Stewart. Uh, yeah, uh, committee and Mr. Chair, if you'll remember, we're under consent order to uh, improve the water system uh, out on West 43rd Street South, and that's the area that's out by the uh, Creek Casino. Uh, we have to replace the uh, uh, existing one inch, and we're not really sure the size, but the water line that's existing to a two and a half to make sure that we have adequate water pressure. Uh, reminder, we did hire Holloway to uh, put the plans together. We submitted the plans and the permit application to ODEQ. They have accepted that, and uh, as part of the program, we have to accept that into the city record as part of a city council action uh, on the permit itself. Uh, we're just about ready to go ahead and do that work. We've got the uh, material almost all uh, in place now or ordered. Uh, we have both the uh, easements that were required uh, should be finalized tomorrow and we should be able to start on that project uh, to keep us well ahead of the time frame that we told o uh, the ODEQ that we would do. Thanks, Mark. So, recommend approval. Move for approval. Second. On a motion and second. Any discussion? Roll call. Deputy Mayor James Gully. Yes. Janie Boydston. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Leanne Langston. Yes. Derek Reed. <coughs> yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. And motion carries. Item number five. Discuss and take action authorizing the city manager to create a, and populate a city of Muskogee sales, sales tax growth team to be charged with reviewing and analyzing sales and use tax data, trends, and issuing regular reports to the city council. Mayor Coburn. I'd ask uh, Mr. Tucker to put this on the agenda for us, and as you will recall, when we approved the budget in June of last year, I'd ask to, that we begin to look at uh, what things needed to happen in order for our sales tax to move in an upward uh, direction and for a strategic plan on, on that happening. Uh, constituting, or this, uh, this team would be put together basically to put together the baseline data for that strategic plan to be put together. Uh, and uh, I think some pretty significant results can come out of that. And if we don't have a plan to improve our sales tax and we just wait on it to happen, uh, I think we're going to be somewhat disappointed by the by the results that we see. So this would be uh, information that we put together to, to, to develop that strategic plan. And uh, uh, a lot of it, uh, homework has been done. Some, uh, Mr. Connolly has put some information together. Uh, uh, Mr. Brown had put some information together. Mr. Tucker, I have some background on that as well. And so I think adding several people to that team We'll put a, a good, uh, well-rounded uh, package together that would be achievable to us. We'll set goals. We'll set uh, time frames to evaluate those goals. And in the case of sales tax, that's a pretty easily measured where we get a month-to-month -month report from the Oklahoma Tax Commission. And so that is uh, my recommendation is that we confirm this team being established. Is this something that each one of the council members will be able to put a person on this committee? Uh, I'm asking for a group of people that would be put on this committee that understand, th have a basic understanding of, of the information that would be analyzed to compress the time to some degree, and then for a couple of citizens that are not uh, council members that could be put on the team as well, uh, and then some city staff would be a part of the team as well. Will the Chamber be involved? I'm sorry? Will the Chamber of Commerce be involved? Yes. They will. Let me clarify one aspect. Um, the mayor had mentioned uh, city staff being involved. When we're talking about analyzing sales tax, uh, sales tax information is confidential. 
Um, and in order to gain uh, that information, we have to have uh, we have to abide by the state laws that relates to the confidential information. And so only city staff uh, can review that information. And so what we'll do is, if the council approves creating that committee, is we'll have a subcommittee that will actually analyze the specific retailers and um, the, the specific dollar figures that go with those retailers. Um, and when it comes to an analyzing those figures as they specifically relate, um, we'll do that internally as staff. And then when it comes to the committee as a whole, we will um, turn that data into something that is more categorical um, so that it's not confidential information that we are reporting to the committee as a whole. Um, we'll uh, either block out the uh, name or we'll uh, round up the figures in such, way, such a way that, you know, it's not identifiable that the uh, X amount of dollars we're talking about in sales tax growth applies to Quick Trip, for example, or to the pilot station. Um, we'll categorize those with, you know, gas station or something like that. I mean, we'll have to do some of those workings in-house, and the, the staff that will be assigned to the committee will form the subcommittee and be in charge of doing that since we're dealing with confidential information. But as it deals with the committee of the whole, then that can be comprised of citizens or whomever um, we uh, appoint to serve on that committee. And then they can review the more public type information because there are two types of information that come out of this. Um, specific sales tax information, then the categorical type that comes out um, from, that's released from the Oklahoma Tax Commission, that is public information. And so if we use a combination of both of those, I think we can get the information that we need um, while, of course, uh, complying with the confidentiality requirements that are within state law. So, so we basically, to have a whatever comes out of this committee is going to be a recommendation to us to move forward with and so, come back yes. to council. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. May we volunteer to be on this committee? Your name is one that I have asked to have uh, included in that group. Specifically. Okay. okay. Move for approval. Second. A motion to second. Any questions or discussion? Broke off. Deputy Mayor James Gully. Yes. Janie Boyne. Yes. Winston, Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Leon Langston. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. And the motion carries. Seeing that we had no reckon any citizens wishing to speak, uh, we are now adjourned. I can get back here to my agenda. We'll start the next meeting. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll now call into order the uh, special call meeting for the Muskogee City Council, January 19, 20, 2016. Roll call. Mayor Bob Coburn. Here. Deputy Mayor James Scully. Here. Dan Hall. Here. Marlon Coleman. Here. Janie Boydston. Here. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Leanne Langston. Here. Derek Reed. Here. Now consider item number one. Consider approval of an executive session to discuss and take possible action on the following. A, pursuant to Section 307B2, Title 25, Oklahoma Statutes, consider convening an executive session to discuss negotiations with the Fraternal Order of Police, Lodge Number 95, and if necessary, take appropriate action in open session. B, pursuant to Section 307B2, Title 25, Oklahoma Statutes, consider convening an executive session to discuss negotiations with the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Local Number 2465, and if necessary, take appropriate action in open session. We will now consider executive session. Uh, Mayor, it's my understanding that item A will be stricken. Okay. Move that we go into executive session. Second. Got a motion? Second. And a second. Any discussion? Roll call. <coughs> Deputy Mayor James Gully. Yes. Janie Boydston. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Leanne Langston. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. Motion carries. We'll now consider ourselves in executive session. We'll now reconvene from executive session. Roll call, please. Mayor Bob Coburn. Here. Deputy Mayor James Gully. Here. Dan Hall. Here. Marlon Coleman. Here. Janie Boydston. Here. Wayne Johnson. Here. Leanne Langston. Here. Derek Reed. Here. Um, item number one B. Yes, Mayor. Yes, sir. Pursuant to Section 307B2, Title 25, Oklahoma Statutes, Council did convene an executive session to discuss negotiations with the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Local Number 2465. And after being fully briefed on the matter, I believe a motion would be appropriate, a, a 
appropriate, tentatively approving the contract as written and subject to the ratification by the union and further authorize the mayor to execute the same. So moved. Second. Motion and second. Any comments or discussion? Roll call. Deputy Mayor James Gully. Yes. Janie Boydston. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Leanne Langston. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. Motion carries. And that concludes our agenda for today. Thank you.